This is Valley News Live at 5. Good afternoon, everyone. Children aged 5 to 11 are receiving COVID vaccines across the country after the CDC signed off. And while the kid-sized doses are welcome news for many parents, others remain skeptical. And that has medical experts and the Biden administration on a mission to reassure parents that the benefits of the shot outweigh the risks. Alice Barr has the very latest. Today, smaller shots in little arms as children age 5 to 11 begin receiving the Pfizer COVID vaccine. I'm halfway there to doing no masks and stuff that I couldn't do before. It's huge relief. Um, you know, the grown-ups are vaccinated, but when you have an unvaccinated child at home, you're still thinking about what can I bring home? The head of the CDC authorized the shots for young kids overnight after a panel of experts unanimously recommended the move. In clinical trials, vaccination was found to be nearly 91% effective in preventing COVID-19 among children ages 5 to 11. In clinical trials, vaccine side effects were mild. 15 million doses are already arriving at hospitals, pharmacies, and doctor's offices across the country. We've been planning and preparing for months to vaccinate our children. Our program will be ramping up this week and more doses shipped out each day. The two shot vaccine is one third the size of an adult dose and comes in a smaller needle. More than 28 million kids are now eligible, but polls show many parents are on the fence. Doctors urging them to talk to their pediatrician, with children now making up a quarter of new COVID cases. Roughly 700 have died since the pandemic began. You have to look at the risks of COVID, which are substantial for kids, versus the risk of the vaccine, which seems to be really limited, mostly to sore arms. For children long tired of interruptions to school and sports, a shot at a return to normal. The COVID vaccine is free and the Biden administration wants to make it as easy as possible to parents to sign up their kids with many schools and community centers planning vaccine events. Meanwhile, the state of Minnesota will begin administering the uh, shots later this week. Governor Tim Wall is saying that there are 500,000 5 to 11 year olds who are eligible in the state and that is going to be a real game changer in the fight against the virus. We want to get as many as possible vaccinated, and um, once we do, things start to look a lot better going into the holidays. Sanford and Essentia say that they have vaccine for kids. Sanford will be administering the lower dose vaccine starting tomorrow, but keep in mind you're going to have to make an appointment. You can find information by going to our website at valleynewslive.com. A lot of parents are wondering what the next steps are when it comes to vaccinating their children. We've taken your questions to local health officials and we'll get them answered tonight on Valley News Live at 6. Three months into the school year and parents are still rallying to get rid of mask mandates. Valley News team's J.C. Dodd spoke with a group this morning that continue to stand in opposition. Somebody's got to say something. This group of people gathered outside of Fargo Cass Public Health to stand against school districts like Fargo imposing mask mandates. Something the Let Parents Decide that group has been protesting since August. I really do not like the fact that the Fargo Public Schools is forcing kids to wear masks. Some say the mask mandate ignores people's freedom to choose. It's unconstitutional. They're not taking our rights into consideration. Jeremy Carlson has four kids in the Fargo School District. He says he thinks the Fargo School Board is using Fargo Cast Public Health to not have to take a stance in the masking debate. They have totally skipped on their responsibility here. They've, they've put everything in their hands. The Cass County Public Health is recommending it. Carlson gave a nod to the West Fargo School District, which has not adopted a universal mask mandate this school year. Look at the facts. Look at West Fargo. Look at Fargo. Make your determination. In data reported on November 2nd, West Fargo has had 627 total students test positive since August roughly 5% of kids in the district. And on October 29th, Fargo reported 484 students have tested positive this school year, or 4.2% of students. If they can't use common sense to make simple decisions like this to let parents choose, how, I mean, what are they using to make decisions on big financial decisions for the public schools? In Fargo, J.C. Dodd, Valley News Live. And that group says it will continue to fight for parents' rights to choose. When it comes to the weather, the good news is that with each day, passing day, we're getting closer to warmer weather, but we still have to deal with tonight's temps. 
Hutch is here to explain. Hutch. Mike, thanks so much. And also with each passing day, we're getting close to January. So there's that too. We do have clear skies, beautiful sunshine, and it felt wonderful even after a very frigid start. Take a look at these temperatures first thing in the morning as we prepare for a beautiful setting sun. A few of us down in the teens, Langdon, Wahala out towards Kandu, Wadena and Bemidji both in the teens as well. Hey, that sunshine going to work. We've dropped the degree off our high today. We're in the mid 40s in Grand Forks and Fargo. It's even warmer out to the west 50s. Low 50s in the central Dakotas, and we have low 40s out near the Bemidji area on up toward Lake of the Woods. Well, we do have clear skies now, as you can see, but uh, long, calm, and clear nights can equal very cold temperatures. So it does look like a return to cold temperatures for us. There is a small chance of seeing some northern lights again tonight. Clouds have been pesky the last couple of days, and if you find yourself out and about and away from the city lights, look to the north and just see if they're there. It's not guaranteed. It's a small chance, but there is indeed a chance. Temperatures, though, you'll want to bundle up. They'll be diving down towards 30, even into the upper 20s by later tonight. An update on that warm up, Mike, here in just a couple of moments, and we'll talk about that storm we've been watching for next week as well here in a moment. Hutch, how far out of town do you have to drive in order to see the lights? Just to get away from the light pollution. So literally just a couple of miles even north of the town and the city lights will put you in a better position. Good advice. Thanks. Yeah. Authorities have released the name of the man killed by a train over the weekend. Fargo police identifying him as 40-year-old Chadrick Tohey. The incident happened Sunday morning in the 1400 block of Main Avenue. Co-workers, family and friends of a West Fargo student who passed away are gathering to support his family during this time of grief. Caden was a student at Cheyenne High School at, a, at, at this high school week. The administration sent notification that the sophomore unexpectedly died. Caden's co-workers at Sky Zone are holding a remembrance from 6 to 8 tonight. It's a private gathering, but they've uh, invited anyone who knew Caden to attend. In lieu of ticket sales, Sky Zone is accepting memorials. We've got good news this afternoon concerning that West Fargo police officer who suffered a heart attack while on duty over the weekend. We're told he is now off a ventilator and is breathing on his own. Officer Tim Brown remains in stable but critical condition at the Nebraska Medical Center. Sunday, he was booking two women into the Cass County Jail when he collapsed and became unresponsive. A GoFundMe has been set up to raise funds for Brown and his family. You can find more information about that on our website, and donations can be made to the Bell Bank uh, to the West Fargo Police Association account in support of Brown. In Minneapolis, voters have re-elected Mayor Jacob Fry after a bitter race that focused on the calls for changes to policing and racial justice. More than a dozen candidates ran to be mayor, including those who had issues with the way that Fry handled changes to the police department since one of its officers killed George Floyd last year. He was against the elimination of the police department, which voters seem to agree with since they rejected a proposal to replace it with a new Department of Public Safety. The U.S. Supreme Court justices listened to arguments in a gun control case today. It's the first major gun control case that they've listened to in more than a decade. The case centers around a new New York law which says self-defense isn't enough to receive a concealed carry permit. People need to prove a special need to be permitted. The justices also questioned New York's practice of giving more licenses in rural areas compared to city centers like Manhattan. But the liberal justices seemed okay with restricting guns in densely populated areas. Is it supposed to say you can carry a concealed gun uh, around uh, the streets of the town or outside just for fun? I mean, w w they are dangerous guns. It's supposed to be what New York says that they give to lots of applicants, at least in other counties, which is an unrestricted license. The attorney for the men challenging the law says that he is not challenging the ability to prohibit guns in special places such as churches or schools. A decision on the case is expected to be handed down sometime next spring or early summer. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is making a major change to President Joe Biden's massive spending bill. She announced today that she's adding four weeks of paid family and medical leave to the measure. Now that provision was included in an earlier draft before Democrats scrapped it. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin's steadfast opposition to paid family leave makes it unlikely a bill that includes it could make it through that chamber. Cybersecurity experts in the U.S. are telling organizations across the country to update their computer systems to protect them from hackers. 
Today, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency issued a sweeping directive to all federal civilian agencies. The agencies have two weeks to update both their hardware and software, as well as shore up any potential system vulnerabilities. They also must have in place a process that reduces the impact of security issues. The directive applies to every agency except the Pentagon, which is in charge of its own networks. Our sister station in Panama City, Florida was taken off the air over the weekend after someone vandalized its broadcasting equipment. We're told that the station was able to get its satellites back up and working yesterday. After WJHG's eight stations were taken off the air, an employee went outside to check out the problem and ran into the likely vandal. The man said he was with a local Air Force base and was told to cut the wires due to a power issue. Then he ran away. And disabling, strategically cutting a uh, cable that provided, uh, that linked all of our satellite dishes to, uh, to our facility. Investigators say that the man could face serious federal charges. It's time for the fruit to be taken off the trees, and after the weather, some sound advice on what to do with harvested apples. Sound advice as we are going through North Dakota's Winter Weather Awareness Week with the chance of some wintry weather. Check those carbon monoxide detectors for batteries. They could come in handy. Fire is certainly something that can happen this season. Keep in mind of that. Have an update for a warming trend in your forecast and we'll update you on our storm chance next week right after this.